Welcome to the latest installment of Just One Thing. In this episode, I'm going to walk you through using the Windows Azure Management Portal. There's a lot of features and functionality in there, and I just kind of want to give you an overview of all the different things you can do in the portal itself. And what makes it so great about this particular presentation is that there are no slides. It's all demo. So let's get to it. So first, you see I've got Internet Explorer open here, and I'm going to navigate to windows.azure.com. Now, of course, if you don't have an account, you'll need to sign up. I happen to have one, so I'll log in with my credentials. Oh, and, of course, I should use the correct password. And what you'll notice here, this is, a, this is an experience built on Silverlight. So it's a, it's a great portal and a number of different things you can do. Sometimes it does take a while to load. Um, I, I will I will tell you that right up front. But you'll see here you land. Nice starting page kind of telling you what's going on in the portal, how to do a number of different things. But we'll kind of, I'll let you explore that on your own. I want to walk you through a few features here, or actually a number of different features. But the first thing I'll show you is beta programs. The Windows Azure team is constantly releasing new features and functionalities and allowing you to to use those as part of the as part of the process they want to get your feedback on it so you'll see here I'm in a number of different programs uh, but you'll see the programs listed here and you can simply if you're not in one click the apply for access button and usually depending on depending on the program it can take a one to two maybe three days possibly a business week uh, to get enrollment um, and you'll get an email telling you uh, you've been activated or you can just log into the portal and see that you've been activated as well so from here um, We've got the beta stuff out of the way. Let's first talk about hosted services, storage accounts, and the CDN. So this this is the portion of the portal where you go and you create hosted services. A hosted service is where you're actually running web and worker roles in the cloud. You can also create storage accounts to store data and tables, blobs, and queues. Um, so here's the hosted service. I can create a new hosted service. I can specify a name. Um, my great service. Then enter a URL or prefix for your service. So this is um, this is this is unique across the entire um, Azure data center. So I can say my great Windows Azure service, and it'll let you know if it's already in use or not. Let's see if that one is. No, nope, we're good. Next, I can choose a region. So I could say I want North Cent I want to store this service in uh, or I want to host it in North Central U.S., which happens to be Chicago. Or I can do something called an affinity group. An affinity group allows me to group services and storage accounts together. Oh, and it looks like this one's already taken. So we'll say 512. Oh, so this contains words on the list of forbidden word. Okay, fine. Adam's awesome service. Try that. Well, I'm sure that one's not available. All right, anyway, moving on. You also have some other options here. Um, so an affinity group I just talked about. Deployment options. Um, you can choose to deploy right now as you're creating the service if you have a package ready to go. Otherwise, you can just select do not deploy. And this will just provision the, the hosted service for you. So we'll get out of here. We're done with that. We're not actually going to create one because I've got a number in place already. You can see here I've got a couple of accounts um, with some services in place. So we've got one for kind of some diagnostic stuff we're doing. Uh, we're doing a time entry app. And we've got this people at RBA app. So a number of hosted services already in place. Similarly, um, so this is where I'm running code. I can also have my storage accounts. And in the, in the process is very similar. I just create a new storage account. Enter my URL. Choose a region. Once again, that region it corresponds to a data center. And click Create. And then you see here, I've already got some in place, so I'm going to leave them as is. And I can delete them as well. I can, um, with storage accounts, to access storage accounts, you actually need to use a key. It's kind of a shared secret model. So I can view the keys here, copy them to clipboard, use them in my Visual Studio applications, etc. User management. So um, I logged into the portal using my Windows Live ID. Uh, you can when you create an account, there's there's an account owner, 
Um, but oftentimes you need to allow multiple people to manage the account, especially in a development environment as you have developers needing to deploy or create and destroy service accounts, etc. You can do that by just adding co-admins, by the add new co-admin button. Uh, they had to do it right now. It's Windows Live ID only. So you just specify their Windows Live ID and which subscriptions you want them to be a co-admin of. Now, co-admins can't do everything that you can as an administrator in this portal. Still, so they can't administer SQL databases or reporting. There's, um, the service bus access control and caching has its own co-admin functionality. Um, virtual networking isn't there yet either. Really, this co-admin is for the ho hosted service and storage accounts. If you're using the VM role in the cloud, that's a virtual machine role where you can create your own custom Windows Server 2008 R2 images. You can uh, upload your own images uh, and you can view what images you have here. And if you're using the CDN as well, you can create new CDN endpoints, uh, enable CDN on various storage accounts, etc. Then at the database option, this is where you can provision SQL uh, Azure databases, and I'll show you how to do that real quickly. I'll go to one of my subscriptions here, and the first thing I need to do, you just create a server. So once again, it's always about selecting your data center. Click Next. You just need to provide an admin account and password, and they do enforce various rules here. Oh, my passwords don't match. I'll do that again. One more time. Click Next. Um, you do have to specify, by default, nothing can connect to SQL Azure. If, you, if you're going to have hosted services that you want to connect, you'll need to allow this other Windows Azure services to access the server. And then you can add, uh, if you want to connect to it from SQL Server Management Studio on your machine, you need to add your own IP address. So I could click Add here, and you'll see it just tells me what my IP is. So I could say, give it a name, My Home Office. And this would allow me to connect via... SQL Server Management Studio. Once I have the server, now I've only created a server, the next thing I need to do is actually create a database. So there's an option up here to create a database. My DB. Specify an addition. So I have web or business. And really the only differentiator between the two is just the available sizes. In web, I can either have a 1 or 5 gig. And in business, I can have 10, 20, 30, up to 50 gigs all in increments of 10. 50 gig is the current limit for SQL Azure. So there are, there are some limitations currently. Um, that, that will be changing over time, um, but just be very aware of that, that you do have limitations. And you can grow these at any point in time as well. Click OK. And now I've just created a, a, a SQL Server and a SQL Server database in a matter of minutes. Pretty cool. Similarly, I can delete them, which I'll, I'll do. I'll drop the server and the database. Now it's gone. So really great, great way to spin up databases quickly for development and tear them down uh, once you're done. If you need BI in the cloud, of course, you can use reporting. Um, I happen to be signed up. You see I have an account here. I can go and I can start provisioning reports. Um, I can send reports up to the cloud if I want to. So I can run my SQL Server reporting services reports from the cloud rather than, a, than an on-premise server. Next up, I'm going to save the service bus access control and caching uh, for the end. But next up, we have virtual network. So the virtual network functionality enables me to do a couple of things. You'll see there's connect and traffic manager. Connect allows me to create a virtual private network between Windows Azure, my, res my specific resources in Windows Azure, that is, and my on-premise data center or my on-premise resources. So I just talked about SQL Azure's limitation of only 50 gigs uh, maximum size for a database. If I have a database that's much larger than 50 gigs and I can't move it to the cloud, my application can't handle federation or sharding, but I still want to access but my, but the application. There's no reason why it can't run in the cloud. I can use Windows Azure Connect to allow my applications running in the cloud to reach back down into my on-prem data center and access that SQL Server database. So um, this is one of the many possibilities you can use Windows Azure Connect for, and I'll, and I'll devote a whole episode of just one thing to Windows Azure Connect itself. It's a technology I'm very excited about. You then have Traffic Manager. Traffic Manager enables you to do some pretty cool things. Um, you're probably all aware, or you may have at least heard about the fact that Amazon had a major outage in one of its data centers. Um, I can't remember how many hours it was for. It was significant. And in fact, I was talking to some uh, customers just the other day who had who were seriously impacted. Uh, they were using kind of Azure EC2 for their development environment, and the whole thing went down basically 
killing their developer productivity for an entire day. So the reason that happened and it's affected so many people is because everybody put their apps in one data center, thinking that one data center could never go down. While the odds are that it won't go down, I mean, the reality is there, there are humans involved somewhere. Errors do happen. So Traffic Manager enables you to deploy your applications to multiple data centers and then route traffic appropriately. So let's say I have an application and I'm, I have it deployed in the North Central or the Chicago data center. Well, if this is a highly critical or mission critical application for my business, maybe it's how we generate revenue, it'd be a good idea to maybe host it in the South Central data center as well and then use Traffic Manager to balance traffic between the two. That way, if North Central ever went down or South Central ever went down, my traffic would get routed to the other data center. I wouldn't technically have any downtime. There are, of course, things you need to think about with that, especially in terms of data. Um, do I need to sync data across data centers? It, traffic Manager won't do that for you. So there, there are a number of implications involved with this, but Traffic Manager at least enables you to, um, in some ways, avoid or kind of protect you against some of the issues people experienced with uh, the Amazon outage. But once again, there's a lot of things you need to consider if you're going to run in multiple data centers. So last component of the portal is the service bus access control and caching. And actually, this is a little bit confusing. It's not fully integrated into this portal. Um, I, had the, I had the privilege of talking to one of the guys that works on the Windows Azure storage team, and he was telling me about how this portal is built. And it's actually about five different teams have to bring all their components into this portal, and you got to get them all working together. And the App Fabric team, it's getting there, but they're not quite fully integrated yet. But you'll see the access or the app fabric portion of this portal enables you at least to get to access control service, uh, the service bus, and caching. So if I want to do access control, I can set up my namespaces here. But if I actually want to modify my access control service, I get routed to another portal. So if I click on this, click on access control service, you'll see here I'm actually I actually got moved to a different portal, and it's specifically for this namespace. If we go back again, or again, we'll just go back to windowsazure.com. So it's not the smoothest of experiences yet. But it's getting there. So here we go. We'll go back to the portal. We'll click on the service bus access control and caching. So if I want a service bus namespace, I can do that. I can get my keys here. Um, with service bus, you actually have a connection pack size. So how many connections do I want to purchase? Um, and then you also have a caching service, talked about uh, a little bit. This enables, this gives you a distributed cache running in the cloud. Um, so you just have a caching namespace. And if I go to cache, one of the cool things here is that I can use this caching service not only to cache my data, I can use it to store session state. Because remember, we're dealing kind of in, in Azure in a stateless environment. I shouldn't have anything, especially session, running in proc because those machines could go down. And they're load balanced. There's no such thing as session affinity or sticky ports. So I need to use kind of a durable store for session. Typically, you'd use C you could use SQL Azure. You could also use Azure Table Storage. But by far and away, the best way to go, uh, the most performant way is to use um, caching or the caching service and what's cool is that it's just like any other provider you use for session state um, just gives you some configuration so if I set up a namespace what I can do is I can click view client configuration and it'll give me a whole bunch of XML here that I can copy and paste into my web config file you'll see here it just gives me a whole bunch of things I can copy and paste. I can use it just for caching my data. Uh, any any managed object can be cached. Um, I can use it for session state as well. If I want to use that, let's see here. Where is it? Here we go. Here's session state. I can also use it for page output caching as well if I want to do, do some of that too. So it gives me all the configuration I need. I can copy and just paste this into my web config file and kind of modify it based on what features uh, I'm actually using. Now the last thing I want to point out about this portal is that um, most everything I've done so far you can automate. On this portal it exposes uh, a series of REST based web services that enables me to consume it. Uh, I can consume it via code. I can consume it via PowerShell. So I can automate a lot of the tasks I would typically do in the portal. Um, that way, for example, uh, one of the biggest ones, especially when talking about hosted services, is controlling the number of instances. So if I want to have, 
you know, five servers or six or seven servers up and running and, and then tear them down or spin, spin new ones up based on various metrics, I can control all of that automatically uh, via REST services. So you don't have to come into the portal to do most of these things, um, but it is a good way to kind of get familiar with what's going on. And that brings us to the end of this version of Just One Thing. So hopefully it gives you some good information about how to use the Windows Azure Management Portal and all the various things you can start looking into uh, to get familiar with managing your Azure hosted solutions.